Hi everybody. Sorry to not be there with you today. I'm sure someone said I've just tested positive for COVID uh, late Saturday night. And so um, I'm sending you this message today via video, much like in the lockdowns. It's giving me those kind of flashback vibes filming in my bedroom. But I did want to share these thoughts with you today. And, um, you know, we've, someone has just read, I think Mark has just read uh, the Enfleshed Liturgy for today. We've been We've been looking at um, the words from Unflesh throughout Lent. And for me, they've always kind of really touched at the right points in my journey along these numbers of weeks. And no less today, I think, for Easter. I, I love the opening part of it where it says, Don't be fooled by the way we tell the story. Resurrection is rarely a swift occurrence. Just look to forest floors or the pages of history and find the pace of sacred things. I think, you know, when we think of Easter, we think of resurrection, we think of new life, we think of the culmination of the of the Holy Week, of the Easter journey. Um, but I think one of the things that we often can lose sight of, because we're so familiar with this story, is that those who were living it, those who were experiencing it, did not know that Sunday was coming. They did not know resurrection was around the corner. They didn't know new life was coming. And for many of us, you know, we're, we might find ourselves in the midst of different kinds of stories that, <laughs> that we don't know what the ending is. We don't know where it's going to resolve. Uh, we don't know if it's going to resolve. And so um, I think I take a little bit of courage in the fact that I can look at the story of Easter and try to kind of put myself in the shoes of the disciples and those who are following Jesus and try to walk the journey uh, with them. So you, you might have spotted that I'm calling this this talk today slow resurrection and there's a reason for that. It's because resurrection can feel extremely slow when you don't know when it's going to happen. Um, and I want to point us back to as we've been talking over the last number of months about context and contextualization and looking back at what it is that helps us know and experience scripture and our understanding of Jesus in the most accurate way that we can. So here's a little, um, here's the, the image that we've, we put up a number of weeks ago of the kind of lenses of context, where we think about the different layers through which, the different lenses through which we can understand Jesus' story and Jesus' experience. And um, without going back over all of this again, one of the key things that we can understand is his local context and what was happening. What would people have understood about resurrection and new life in the ancient world? Um, many of us um, also have this really particular theology that we've grown up with, especially like me. If you've grown up in an evangelical um, kind of a upbringing, at least in my upbringing, people really were very focused on um, Jesus' death and resurrection, bringing life after death, and that being the primary focus of what was going on. And in fact, you know, a lot of my faith journey growing up was very much about trying to get that security, that freedom, that certainty of what was going to happen after you die as the main focus of what Jesus' death and resurrection was about. And we'd obsess about it to the point where sometimes I think it pushed us to have less of an awareness of the suffering and the injustice and the fleshiness of the people around us and the things that people really needed in their bodies and in their in their lives. And it, 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 there was almost like this, um, sometimes this is probably an outdated reference, but I thought of it as like trickle down, um, salvation in a way there was a uh, Billy Graham who was a, a great evangelist um, especially in the 80s used to talk about um, you know that if just people's souls were changed then it would bring all this social change um, to the world and you know almost like you know a Reagan or a Thatcher economics kind of version of spirituality and spiritual change which I don't think is actually very gospel um, the gospel is fleshy. The God, Jesus lived and died in flesh. And to me, that is fundamentally about how flesh matters and people matter and human bodies and experiences matter in this life, not just the next. Um, so back to the context of what was going on. So in the ancient world, there, there would be different views of what life after death and resurrection might mean. So for pagans, um, pagans 
you know, just saw death. There was like a one way journey to death. He couldn't really do much about it. There was conversations in pagan circles about whether um, you know, some people thought, oh, it'd be really quite nice if there was life after death, and that we our bodies were resurrected into flesh and we could live. But that's not going to happen. And then some people thought, well, it'd be quite nice to have. Um, you know, our spirits floating around, but that's probably not going to happen either. So there was quite a, a dark view of, of death. Um, and the word resurrection, often when it was used, well, when it was used, whether it was in Greek or Latin or any of the other equivalents in the ancient world, um, it wasn't just used as like resurrecting to a spiritual life. It, it specifically meant resurrecting bodies after death. Jewish view of what was happening was very much that people would die, um, they would be with God in some mystical way for a period of time, and then at the final judgment there would be resurrection of the physical body and into a into a real place. And so um, there was, but at the same time, that wasn't, they weren't, they didn't have that obsessive idea about uh, life after death that so many of us have been raised with. It was kind of like, well, that might be, but their focus was more in this world, in this time. Um, for, for most Jews, it was something that might happen, could happen, but they weren't necessarily sure. And if the discussions were happening, it was about like, in what way the physical bodily resurrection would happen, not just a kind of floaty spiritual resurrection. In his book Surprised by Hope, Tom Wright talks about this, and I'm just going to read a section of what he's written about what Jesus' perspective on life after death and resurrection would be. Remember, resurrection of the physical body. He says, Jesus' own teachings during his brief public career simply reinforced the Jewish picture. He redefined a lot of ideas that were current at the time, notably kingdom of God itself, explaining in many coded parables and symbolic actions that God's sovereign saying saving rule was now breaking in, even though it didn't look like what his contemporaries imagined and wanted. But Jesus hardly tried to redefine the notion of resurrection. But when he did, in one brief uh, and cryptic moment to his closest followers, they didn't have a clue what he was talking about. It's referring to the point at the Last Supper where Jesus talks about raising again after three days and leaves his friends a bit confused. Um, it wasn't as if, and Tom Wright goes on to say, it wasn't, it wasn't that they didn't know about resurrection. It was rather that they never thought that as Jesus seemed to be implying, it was something that would happen to one person ahead of everybody else. And it shows, of course, that the crucifixion of Jesus was the end of all their hopes. Nobody dreamed of saying, oh, that's all right, he'll be back in a few days. Nor did anybody say, well, at least he's now in heaven with God. They were not looking for that kind of kingdom. They didn't have that kind of certainty. Whatever their expectations and however Jesus had been trying to redefine those expectations, as far as they were concerned, hope had crumbled into ashes. They knew they were lucky to escape with their own lives. So, I mean, I think it really helps to think about that story of that first Easter, that first resurrection, with that in our minds, that um, that there wasn't this expectation of what was going to happen. For the disciples, they really thought it was over. It was the crushing of their hopes. It was the crushing of their dreams of what it meant to be followers of Jesus. We're, we're going to watch a little clip now from, and I showed the same one last year because I love it, but it's from The Miracle Maker. And I want you to just kind of observe watching this clip. It very closely follows the scripture that is in John chapter 20, one, verses 1 through 29. And I would love for you to just kind of, you know, with all that in your mind, that crushing of hopes that those people would have felt, um, can you just observe what it looks like for those folks to experience resurrection of Jesus in a bodily form? Um, can you sink yourself into that moment and think about what it would have been like to be there? And then there'll be an opportunity to talk about a few questions in a moment. When the Sabbath is over, we'll come back. My Lord, my Lord is gone. He's gone. He's gone. I know. I know. No. No. 
no. Tell me who you're looking for. Oh, sir, if you're the gardener, please tell me where they've taken him. Mary. Lord. It's all right. You don't have to hold on to me now. Go. Tell everyone. Tell Peter. I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. He's alive. <laughs> What is it? What's the matter? See. What, what have you seen? Saint, come. The Lord. You've seen Jesus? Mary. All the others are down below comforting each other. Come on. He's alive. I've seen him with my own eyes. Come on. The grief has made you mad. Who's... Who's done this? I've seen it with my own eyes. <sighs> the Lord! I... He was... I thought they'd taken the body. Who? The priests, Romans, but... He was there, he was there in front of my eyes the Lord. in front of me this near right here like I cannot believe what I'm hearing Thomas I saw him you're all crazy all of you dreams and visions everyone's going mad I'm leaving oh the Lord oh. No. we have we've seen it where on the road from Jerusalem on the road right right beside us well I'm sick of it. I'm oh, sorry, but... This. Well, unless I see him right here, right here, before me, like that, in front of me, right here, and unless I see the mark of the nails and put my finger into those wounds, I will not believe. Thomas. What? Thomas. I've got nothing to say on this matter to anyone. Any... Any... Anyone at all. Go on. Put your finger here. Touch the marks. Don't be a doubter anymore. Believe. My Lord. And my God. Yes. You believe because you've seen me, Thomas. But even happier are those who will believe without ever seeing me at all.
I hope that discussion was helpful, just beginning to use some of our spiritual imagination to think about what it would be like to get into the minds and hearts of those who experience resurrection in a bodily form in the way that Jesus presented it, completely, you know, with having had no concept that that was something that would happen. I think it's amazing. I, I just wanted to add a few other extra little thoughts before I say goodbye via video. Um, for early Christians, I, I th it's really interesting to think about how um, the, our understanding of resurrection and even how, how what happened between the time of um, the early Christians really having more of a Jewish perspective on resurrection that didn't keep it as the focus of everything to um, maybe my experience, you know, <laughs> growing up in the in the 80s and 90s where that was where life after death was the primary focus of everything in terms of faith, the ultimate goal. It's, it, it was a very slow progression, a slow drift toward that. And certainly in the early church, that belief was much more of a Jewish style one that's evolved and it even evolved in the times of the scriptures. And um, perhaps we'll have a look more deeply at that over the coming months. Um, but I wanted to get back before we kind of I hand over to um, to the music team to lead some songs. Um, I wanted to link this back in again with what we were talking about, about slow resurrection and how that sense of being in the story, looking ahead to the end, really matters. And especially for us now, like maybe maybe that's where you are. You're, you're looking ahead to an uncertain future. And I, I was reading this week, there's um, a feminist Christian theologian named Sarah Bessie, who I just tend to really love what she writes and what she thinks about. And um, she writes a lot about deconstruction. And she's written this week about uh, resurrection in light of de deconstruction. And I'm just going to share a few thoughts that she's written to close out this time. Sometimes resurrection feels like growing up. You, take, you think it's taking forever, but then you're out on your own in your grown-up life, and you realize how short your childhood really was in the scheme of things. Now you've got all this life ahead of you as the person who you were always headed toward becoming. Everything that came before this moment felt like everything that ever would be. But now you know it was just the beginning. Look how much life is on the other side. Open up your heart, my friends. If the big, gorgeous displays of resurrection, restoration, and revival show up, I imagine we won't miss it. But don't be surprised if resurrection creeps in like the sunrise. Resurrection may be hiding in your life already. Look at all the ways you are standing up, rising up against the odds. I love that idea of um, the small ordinary ways of resurrection that happen in our lives and that it isn't all just about the big the big bright flashes of light and for some of us you know having those big bombastic views of of resurrection and what that means and you know the you know we have to change the world and be part of every solving every problem that actually can be something that can be quite scary and turn us off from even wanting to um be able to engage with the idea at all so you know, if that's you today, maybe there's little shoots of life that you can start to spot in your own life in in, in small ways, in big ways, um, and that you can cling to that as your um, reminder of new life this Easter Sunday. <laughs>